Hi, welcome to everyone's favourite segment, Mailbag. I've got quite a lot of stuff here today. I may not get through it all. So, first one comes from Australia, from someone you probably know, and you should know, um, Halcyon from the EEV Blog Forum. Thank you very much. He's one of the uh, moderators, and uh, he sent something very cool in. I do know what it is. So, yeah, thank you very much. All right. Let's have a squeeze. Now, this can be the first entry, perhaps, in a series that I was going to do. I did actually leave this, um, I did actually put a poll on, oh, isn't that schmick? Oh, he said two, two, thank you very much. I did put a poll on the uh, community tab for about uh, coins, because I'm into coins, as was uh, my old man was into uh, coins. I love coins, and this is um, the Australian Signals Directorate, and I'll link in the uh, video down below. They had their 75th anniversary, and I did a tour of uh, the exhibition down in Canberra, so I'll link that one in. That was very interesting, um, as well as other stuff uh, down in Canberra as well. And this is a 50 cent Australia uncirculated coin. Now this king rubbish, genuine queenie, uh, 50 cent Australian coin, and uh, this is, uh, yeah, to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the Australian Signals Directorate. This is not a, I don't believe this is a proof uh, coin, because there are you know, proof type coins. Anyway, uh, the poll on the uh, community tab said, should I do videos on like showing off coins? Just quick, you know, couple of minutes tops videos just showing off a different type of coin every week. And after I did the poll, duh, I thought people were probably thinking that I was talking about crypto coins. No, I'm talking about real, actual, um, you know, physical coins. So anyway, leave, leave it down in the comments. Um, I'll pin a uh, comment and if it gets enough thumbs up, I'll do a regular segment showing off some coins because I've got some interesting coins. By the way, I'm shooting this with my new camera rig attached to my bench. So is it shaking? Is it shaking? No, I think I've got camera stabilization on. <laughs> the camera's shaking, trust me. And uh, hooked up to my ATEM switcher, it's weird, because the uh, camcorder is not actually recording. It's my ATEM switcher that's recording. Anyway. All right, so what we have here is what's called a uh, numismatic coin, because it not only is official uh, Australian currency, but that's basically what uh, collectible uh, coins like this are called, as opposed to like medallions and uh, challenge coins in the US. That's a thing, apparently. And uh, like, you know, geo coins. They're not uh, numismatic uh, coins, so to speak. But anyway, um, yeah, this is official Australian currency, there's Her Majesty. So the portrait on the back of a uh, numismatic coin like this is called an effigy, and that's uh, uh, Queen Elizabeth II, of course, and yes, this is actual legal uh, currency. You could, in theory, um, go and spend this, but you wouldn't, of course, because it's worth more as a uh, numismatic. So although it comes in like this uh, plastic case, that is not like a hermetically sealed case. That's just like uh, like cardboard. I could just uh, split that open like that. So it's not what's called a proof coin. The proof coins are usually finished to a much higher, like polished to a much higher uh, standard, and then they're encapsulated hermetically sealed in an encapsulated uh, case. So they're called proof coins. Where this, this is just called, um, you know, the finish of the coin is just uncirculated like this, but they only made 50,000 of them, and it's a uh, copper nickel uh, diameter, 31 millimeters for those playing along at home, and it is 50 cents genuine Australian government from the Royal Australian Mint. So there you go, this just uh, commemorates the history of uh, the 75th anniversary of the Australian Signals Directorate. So th that is a very nice coin. I like the uh, look of it, and it apparently it does have a code on it, and uh, <laughs> Halcyon told me that somebody has, or a few people, have actually decoded what's on there. So yeah, if you want to have a crack at that, if you can read that on the uh, HDs on the big screen, you might be able to... Uh, yeah, decode that, someone, apparently, it's already been done. Of course they put a code on the thing, uh, it's pretty neat. But I, I really like the packaging there, that is a fine collectible coin, I like that. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. So anyway, let me know if you'd like to see, like, a regular series of me, just, like, taking just a minute, a couple of minutes, um, to show off and talk about, uh, different types 
of coins like this. I'll leave a pinned comment down below. If enough people thumbs it up, I'll start a series. There are two companies in Australia, by the way, who can actually make official uh, currency coins. One is the Royal Australian Mint, which this one's from, and the other one is from the uh, Perth Mint uh, over in Perth, obviously, and uh, they're a wholly owned uh, government, uh, you know, private organisation. Not sure how long this one's uh, been there, but um, it just says South Lake Post Office, so it's addressed to mailbag um, here in Australia. So, I don't know. No idea. Thank you, anonymous person. Anonymous is okay. By the way, if you want to send something in, PO Box 7949, Norwest, New South Wales, 2153, Australia. Not Austria. Mailbag. Thank you very much, Christian. Hi, Dave. I'm a silent follower of your channel. I send you these interesting vintage military devices. Could be cool to see how it operated and filmed with a high-speed camera. Oh, okay. Might have to dig out the uh, high-speed camera for this one. Check it out. It's an NEC jobby. What is it? M779 there. And it's a one-shot. <laughs> it's a one-shot relay. Unfortunately, you get in the reflection off my light there but you can see that there's a spring-loaded contact in there and then down at this end here you can see that there's two pins there so obviously when this is activated it gets to a point where like you pass enough current through this and this whatever happens in here it releases this spring and that contact boom rams down there and makes contact, you'd get some contact bounce on that, I'm sure. If you wanted to use it for digital logic uh, trigger, you'd have to uh, have a debouncer on that. But yeah, it fires that pin down there and activates the, you know, and just makes contact down here. So what could this be uh, used for? Uh, some sort of, you know, ultra reliable military application or something where it, you know, you can't rely on circuitry you know a simple current passes through here and it's a one-shot deal and you need to activate something in an emergency and you have to absolutely make sure it works and well it's going to work because it's a spring so yeah i don't know but uh, leave it in the comments down below if you've ever used one of these i guess one shot relay i have no idea what current uh, that's going to activate that but let me know uh in the comments if you want me to get the high speed camera out and uh whack that on the second channel that could be fun. <laughs> Thanks, Christian. Thank you, another anonymous person. Um, it's, it just says dispatch uh, from right on me. It might be one of these reshipped uh, things. So, thing I didn't know. Jesus. Thank you very much, Olight, um, who are a manufacturer of torches. None of that flashlight rubbish. Torch here in Australia. Check it out. Um, this is an absolute monster. The Marauder 2. Wow. 14,000 lumens, 800 meter throw. Oh, that's just insane. Discharge, how many watts is that? Like tens of watts? Perrin, two, I thought it was pre-run. No, Perrin, two. Um, once again, oh, that, that looks like it might go on, that looks like it might be like a headlamp. That's got the orientation of like a, uh, you can get like a headband and you put them sideways. You can either have it as a torch or a um, headband type thing. And then we've got the, um, oh, bicycle light. Yes, thank you very much. I need a bicycle light. My one is crap. In fact, I have three crap bicycle lights that are all just falling apart. Okay, this thing just looks insane. The Olight Marauder 2 Adapt and Conquer. Um, 800 meters, 14,000 uh, lumens. And I, this is just nuts. It weighs 750 grams. It's IPX8 uh, rated, so basically uh, waterproof and one meter uh, drop proof. And it's got two different modes, floodlight and spotlight. So it'll do 850 lumens. Jeez, that's already uh, plenty. It'll run for uh, six hours and 40 minutes on that. And it's got an 800 meter uh, throw. But you know, if you want the full 14,000 lumens floodlight, it'll do um, over three hours. It's got a built in 54 watt hour rechargeable lithium ion job be in it um and 2.5 hours to uh fully charge it looks like it can be used as a usb power source for reverse powering stuff as well so there's the blurb you can have a um uh, read this is not something that you would use for like just everyday use or something like that you'd have to be like in search or rescue thank you for joining the olight family um like for search and rescue or something like that where you need to really um you know come on, oh, geez, look at the size of that beast we <laughs> <laughs> that's just god that is that is insane that is insane oh man that feels like it's built like a brick dunny the massive heatsink fins on that anyway it looks like we've got 
rubber baby buggy bumpers on there. I'm not sure how long that's going to last. You know, that could eventually peel off or something. You've got to be careful careful with something like that. So it's got these machine bits here to stop it rolling. So that's good. Um, you could leave it up like that. Can you? I don't think you can take the top off to make it like a flat, like a lantern kind of thing. I don't think it's it's not designed for that. But there you go. Oh, jeez, look at that. Look at the lens on that bad boy. So it's obviously going to have a large cob led down in the middle. Like, oh yeah, I can kind of sort of make it out down in there. But uh, I'm not sure if we're going to be able to do a tear down of this thing. But then, you, then you've got, uh, I think, 12 leads around the outside here which uh, then do like the floodlight so that's the uh, that's the beam and then you can just do the floodlight around there like, like that so dual purpose so wow that's absolutely incredible and that's exactly what you want you know if you're doing search and rescue something like that you'd be walking around with the uh, large floodlit beam like this to light up an area then if you want to try and spot something in distance you switch over to that well <laughs> I don't want to is it charged? Okay, I could blind myself here. Hang on, I might go get my sunnies on. Um, <laughs> anyway, oh yeah. So there you go. Does that those leads there? I guess show the show the level. Um, what is that button? The button there. And I I do like that one. So that one uh, spotlight and flood. So that's nice. I tell you what, I really like this um Stargate um <laughs> iris here. Look at that. Oh, that is sex on a stick. Really, that is pornographic. Look at that. Oh, that just protects, you know, because you're out in the field. You don't want dirt and crap. And, um, and of course, this is uh, supposed to be, you know, IP um, X8 rated as well. So, yeah, you don't want anything getting into your USB connector. That is a Bobby Dazzler. Wow. <laughs> I really love that. I have determined that this is the battery level. So we're on three of seven. And this is the uh, light output level over here. So we're on four. That that feels absolutely fantastic. But, oh, oh no. There, there, there we go. Look at that. It's square. We've got a cob light. <laughs> it's a square cob light output. <laughs> Neat. Right, so what I've got is fixed exposure here on the camera. So this is, so you can get an idea of, like, it's really underexposed now. So that's the minimum. So I'm, like, controlling it like this. And then... That is a <laughs> completely square cob pattern. You can see because the cob is the uh, chip on board uh, led in there, and they're usually square shaped like that. And you can like you can actually see it. And then if I convert to flood, feel like that. Can't do both by the looks of it. So you select either spot or flood like that. So I've got it turned up to maximum. Can I feel that? Yeah, I can feel the heat from that. It's probably not as blinding as I thought it would be okay looking at the other side of the lab once again i am fixed uh exposure here so that's that is really that is maximum uh brightness and then i can turn that down even on absolute minimum like that i still got my lab lights here it is actually reasonable brightness in the lab but i've really stopped that camera down and then if we switch from spotlight to flood like that geez that's nice okay i just switched the lab lights off entirely so it is dark, and that is the flood pattern. Wow, yeah, that's pretty good. I'm liking that. That's a winner. It's a nice, relatively even pattern with a, uh, you know, a little bit of a hot spot in the middle, but that's kind of what you want, really, with the uh, rest of the uh, beam going outwards. That is, that is neat. I'm liking the interface on that, except sometimes if you're, uh, push the button you could actually um, turn it off you know if you're using your thumb but anyway left or right handed very nice to adjust that pattern and you can really just operate this with one hand like that wow I guess the only thing I would like is if you could somehow use both uh, you know flood as well just like a level one or two flood that that would have been nice but <laughs> I like that that's terrific wow that's worth every cent now, unfortunately, I don't have a proper uh, integrating sphere to, like, actually confirm the lumens output on this thing. But, uh, yeah, I'm sure they're doing the business, but let's get the flare on it. So I've had this go in for, you know, the five minutes I've been shooting this. We're up to 42 degrees on the outside. Let me put my hand on that. Yep. So, yeah, it's not propagating too much um, down to the handle, but you can sort of, you can definitely feel the top getting warm, but it's certainly, certainly not getting hot. 
So that heat sink's really doing its uh, job. It's not, it's not going into the lens. The lens is relatively cool, actually. Apart from, you know, if you stick your hand there, you will actually feel the light output heating up, but not much. Like, you can't burn yourself or anything. So it says here it can only do five minutes at 100%. I guess that's to, uh, yeah, like thermally limit it. Um, and then it drops down to 23%, is it? Does that for 140 minutes, it drops down to 11% just for, you know, thermal uh, protection to actually protect the thing. That's nice, I guess, you know, you don't want it just blaring out until it just completely comes the utter. Yeah, I, I don't think we're actually operating on maximum 14,000 lumens here. Level 7 can only be achieved when the battery level is level 4 or above. Yeah, I think we're on, yeah, we're only on level 2. So yeah, yeah, so what you've been seeing here is not full output. I'd have to charge it. My only other criticism would be that uh, it's easy to switch this thing on accidentally. Like if you've got it in your pack unless there's i might have to rtfm but uh you know if you throw it in the back of the ute you're going out somewhere and uh yeah it could actually uh, you know um touch other gear and could accidentally come on so that's a problem so unless they've got some sort of like override lock uh i don't know still don't know what that is oh that felt like a button but that's actually a lanyard hole look that's for the lanyard that you actually get with it. It's uh, thick ass. Look at that. Geez, you could use that as a, you know, that'd be come in handy for something. Um, you know, it's not parachute cord or anything, but right. I just actually uh, fully charged this thing now. So I do actually get the full output capability. I just discovered a mode. Look, it's got a proximity sensor. This is on max output. I put my hand there and it drops down drastically like that. So, um, <laughs> and I point it back at the roof and I can put my hand in front of it. I gotta get pretty close. That actually is a safety measure because that actually feel, if I let it come on like that and I put my hand on, whoa, yeah, that's that's hot, but it, it stops me burning myself. So that is fantastic. Really like that. Okay, thermally, it's getting up to 55 degrees and climbing. There you go, 56 and still climbing. And this is just the uh, wide beam. So we're, yeah, 61, it's certainly going up. And, well, yeah, if I put my hand on that, yep, Ernie Bernie. So that is serious business, but this is absolutely max, and that's just the outer LEDs. Okay, with the spotlight, it seems to be coming down. So it seems to be the... it's coming down in temp. So it's, um, yeah, the main... I thought that would have been the highest uh, output, but no, it's those pesky... Let me change it back to the outer ones now. You can't actually see much of that. Look, it's still cool on the inside and hot on the outside but that would just be the uh, glass actually reflecting Woof, that is a beast yeah i can i can really feel that warming up on my hand now geez yeah um that might get quite hot but anyway we can really dial that back okay we're pitch dark here this is the lowest setting and here we go i'm going up this is the broad light and wow yeah, that's pretty fantastic. And let me set the... There you go. There is our square. <laughs> Look at that. I love it. Giant square like that. That is max. And I can just dial that back like that. But yeah, it's just a shame that it doesn't have a combination of the uh, spotlight with the broader beam, just a little bit. Have the broader beam on like 10%. Okay, this one's a bit more practical for everyday use. This is the RN 1500. This is a uh, bicycle light. So yeah, I currently just use a, uh, I can't remember what brand it is, but it just uses an 18650, uh, uh, you know, rechargeable cell in there. And um, yeah, so this is a similar, sort of thing it'll do 1500 lumens uh, it'll do the flishy flash modes and uh, usb c charging uh 5000 milliamp hour yeah so that's more than what i've got at the moment here you go so comes with the mount this looks pretty schmick oh geez they got wanky packaging that's for sure that feels solid as a brick dunny that's really nice i like that and it's got a weatherproof uh sealed usb c excellent and just on off Maybe it's not charged yet. Looks like you get some straps. They've got they're like plasticky rubber straps that go around. Adjustable straps, I guess. You had an Allen key. There's our mount. Okay. That looks pretty universal. Okay, apparently you've got to press and hold for three seconds. So 
I like that. Can't accidentally switch it on. And two, three. No, no. Oh, there. Right. So you had to click it once and then on. Oh, geez, that looks that looks nice. Okay, so we've got the same conditions as before. That's a decent. I'd have to actually ride it on the bike, but that's you know, and the pattern is what you want. You want a little bit of spread to the outside. You probably want you know seventy percent in the middle. Oh, does this have an output capability as well? Five volts, two point four amps. So you can like emergency recharge your phone or something. That's nice. Anyway, um, the three amp charge capability. I'm liking the look of the mount there. So. I guess we put that in and we screw it like that and it locks it. Yeah, it, it actually clicks in place. That is, that's really schmick. This is a schmicko bike light. I like it. Oh, this is very cool. It also comes with a little uh, optional GoPro mount that can just uh, clip into that. Nice. So when you're riding a bike, you never know when you have to use a power supply. And yep, my micro supply <laughs> works just fine and dandy. No problems whatsoever. Look at that. Beautiful. So, yep, I can uh, power up uh, projects on the back of the bike. And you can power your projects and light them up too. Oh, ah, beauty. Yeah, so you got three different levels there. And I checked and it does power up to the last level that you actually uh, set it at. Uh, the reflector arrangement in there looks really good. It's got an anti glare ridged arrangement on the uh, top there, and that's for you know, so you don't uh, startle the muggles uh, walking around or um, oncoming cars. So that's that's really nice. Unfortunately, it's um, summer at the moment, so it's it's only vaguely dark when I ride home now. It's not uh, pitch black, so I don't have to actually take it out for a deliberate nighttime uh, ride. But yeah, that's going uh, that's not going straight to the pool room. That's going straight on my bike. So I'm not sure how that compares to other bike uh, lights on the market, but uh, yeah, the 1500. This is uh, 80 US uh, dollars. You might be able to get it uh, cheaper on special, but this is a really sweet bit of kit. I think that's uh, worth every cent. There is a smaller RN400, which is uh, almost you know near identical to this, except it's physically uh, smaller and it's only 30 bucks so yeah that that might be enough for basic uh riding but i'd you know i'd prefer a uh bright i'm not going to try and compare them but um geez yeah this is built really well and uh yeah i'm liking its functionality looks and feels like an absolute winner so yeah check that one out so yeah that's um that's going to get a lot of use from me what i couldn't show you with the camera in my bike is you can see i got it mounted on a box there is the light coming out the back you can see that there's a significant amount of light coming out the back there and it just it you know adds a little bit of light behind you so and out to the uh side as well so that uh, people can actually um see you you can see the these beams shooting out the side like that that's all to do with the front uh lens design and it's really quite effective it's not a huge amount of light going out the back but it's just enough to allow people to see you from the side and the rear and things like that fantastic Last but not least, we've got the uh, Perrin, I guess, uh, Perrin 2 uh, headlamp. This is actually a headlamp. It does actually come with a really funky looking uh, rubber like headband attachment. Of course, you can just use it as a normal uh, torch like this. Anyway, 166 meter throw, uh, 2500 lumens, which is uh, not too shabby at all. Built-in proximity sensor, drop brightness in case of obstruction. Uh, that's not bad if you're... You know, if you're doing uh, you know, climbing or something like that, and when you're against the wall, you don't want it like blinding you back in uh, the eyes or something like that. So maybe that's you know a good thing. And a pocket clip for you uh, nerdy uh, fanboys. But uh, yep, IPX8 rated, 1.5 meter drop, all that sort of stuff. Unfortunately, one of the things is it weighs 161 grams, and that's actually pretty hefty. Anyway, it is very sexy. Very nice machine case. Love the heat sinking around here. Don't really... Uh, uh, it's okay if you want the belt clip, but I don't really want that. I'm more interested in this as a headlamp. Now, the one downside to this is that it does have one of these magnetic charger -y things. So if you lose your magnetic charger, well, you're not actually uh, screwed because we can unscrew your being screwed. And, whoop, 
Oh, there you go. Drop test. Um, it's got a uh, 2170 cell in there, 4,000 milliamp hour. So, yeah, you could um, charge that if you've got an external charger for that. No wuckers. Anyway, construction quality is excellent on this thing. Um, these Olight ones are really made very well and it's uh, not positive at the top it's actually positive down in the bottom I have put it in backwards and uh, yeah it just doesn't work doesn't destroy the thing o-ring seal but that is pretty hefty um, and compared to like a regular headlamp you'd have to uh, compare others with like a lumen output versus uh, weight but Geez, you know, you're paying the premium for that alloy case, let me tell you. It sits in there and there like that. So that's pretty groovy like that. And of course, you can just adjust the tilt like that. Anyway, um, they've got a button on the top, which uh, which could get bumped. Um, it's not that easy to bump it, but if you had this in your pack, uh, unfortunately, there doesn't look like there's a lockout on it. So, yeah, you get in the middle of your uh, canyon and... Uh, you get your torch out of your pack and you find wah, 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 wah. you got the um, it turned on inside your pack. Uh, that'll ruin your day. Anyway, it seemed to vi had a vibrate motor in there. I thought I heard it, feel it vibrate. Anyway, it looks like it's got one, two, three, th three different modes like that. Anyway, it does actually come to the last setting you put it at. So that's pretty groovy. And I guess the uh, vibration is designed to tell you that it's done the mode. Switch on our headlamp. There you go. That's not too shabby. That is the, that is the highest brightness. Okay, so we fix the exposure on that. And if I take it down a notch, that's lowest. Which is, yeah, it's more than adequate. Anyway, nice wide pattern. I like it. Nice and even. So, no wackers. Does seem to be good. That is quite bright. That is a decent headlamp. Right, the headband is reasonably comfortable. Don't mind that at all. But the problem is, it does actually feel um, heavy. Like, you wouldn't run with this thing. It's just bouncing all around. It's not a definitely not a uh, lightweight uh, running headlamp. Certainly wouldn't use it for that. But, uh, yeah, I'd have to get myself in a canyon or something. But for a 500 lumen headlamp, ah, I put it into a mode where it's just hold down the button and turn on. So that's pretty good. So yeah, I guess that mode is designed to go in your pack, but if you force the button on like that, she's gonna come on permanently. Oh, I just had it on for a minute there and it automatically switched off. That's the proximity sensor. It doesn't, looks like it doesn't automatically switch back on, but yeah, apparently um, if it's too close to an object and it's been on for a minute, it will actually automatically switch off. So really is uh, quite smart. Apparently if I press this twice, it'll go into turbo mode. Uh, is that turbo mode? Anyway, lots of smart functionality. And yes, if you hold that down, you do actually go into uh, lockout mode for the switch. So that's designed for in the pack. But as I said, you could actually turn it on, but it does actually have timer modes as well. So, so that bad boy is 90 uh, US dollars. You can probably get it uh, cheaper on sale. I do believe they have uh, some sales going on, uh, if not right now, very shortly before uh, Christmas for all the lights. But as with all things, I think personally that's too heavy uh, for a headlamp. I wouldn't use it um, as such. Well, not for long periods of uh, time anyway. I do prefer, uh, you know, lighter weight, uh, smaller ones, uh, headlamps that use uh, AAA batteries in them. I'm just a fanboy of those. But there is no such thing as the perfect headlamp or the perfect uh, torch at all. It's all about what your specific requirements are. And this meets, you know, many different uh, specific requirements, but it's uh, certainly well built. It's got tons of features. I have no doubt it meets its uh, lumen uh, capabilities. I want to get one of those integrating spheres to actually uh, measure light output, but uh, I've been watching, you know, secondhand ones, but uh, they haven't really come up uh, all that often or they're too expensive to ship anyway, uh, you know, because they're giant spheres. So there you go. I'm actually uh, very impressed with OLED. They seem to be a uh, premium maker. The quality of these things is uh, really amazing. And uh, feature set and uh, price point, I don't know. Look, you'd have to have a, do a serious comparison, but they're certainly worthy of consideration. They're very nice. So this will get a uh, lot of use on my bike. I'll still use this. Probably not as a uh, headlamp, and this thing, oh, I'll take it camping next time and uh, scare some of the wildlife, shall I? I mean, that's just insane. That's a beast of a, a torch. Unbelievable. I <laughs> just, it's almost too big, and Chuck, jeez, you could really you could use it as a weapon as well. 
Wow. So thank you very much, Olight, for sending these in. I'll link them in uh, down below this store. I think they've got some specials uh, on, if not uh, shortly, just before uh, Christmas. So, yeah, well worthy of consideration. Okay, I'm going to light up a tree. That's probably 100 metres away. And there we go. Look at that. Beautiful. You can see it. It's square as. Unbelievable. Works a treat. And if I switch it to flood, it still lights up the tree. It gets hard to catch on camera, but yeah, it still does a pretty decent job. But wow, that's great. Thank you very much, Drio or Dreo, for this enormous thing. In fact, there are two enormous things. Um, one they said, like, um, they sent me an email and said, oh, don't worry about the second one or something. It's a bonus. Um, and uh, anyway, it's, we've got an air purifier. Beauty. Breathe pure, live fresh, apparently. Oh, fresher, sorry. All right, I'll put it down here. That's better. We've got a quick start guide. Download the Drio app. There you go, so it's uh, some newfangled smart thing. I've got a uh, Dyson one at home, which is um, awesome, who um, Halcyon put me onto it, who sent these in. Um, and he swears by them, I got one for the home. Yes, they're excellent. Uh, the wife has nabbed it uh, for home. It's the thing with the, you know, I, I photo tweeted a photo of it once. Anyway, better, it's a journey. Better, it's a journey. Okay. Has that new filter smell. <laughs> All right, there we go. Jeez, that's this is decent size. Wow, I like the uh, the foam. That's cool. So uh, this is nice size for a lab, of course. Filter. I, I assume it's like a HEPA grade filter, but I don't know much about it. What is this? Risk of fire. Check the filter inside. Remove the plastic bag. Oh, remove the. <laughs> <laughs> If they've installed the filter in it with the plastic bag on it and then you turn it on and it could catch on fire, that'd be hilarious. All right, so there you go. Yeah, yeah, it's wrapped in. <laughs> you definitely need that because it's, it's dead. It's wrapped in plastic. There we go. So the filter looks like it's pretty funky. Of course, yeah, it's all about the uh, cost of the filters. Oh, well, you've got to get a decent HEPA filter and then it's all about the cost of the filters. I don't know. I don't know. It looks pretty coarse and there's no carbony stuff in it. So filter guideline, back cover, filter, start, strap, must point outwards. Okay. This is convenient. I can just do this on camera here at the bench. Um, so that goes in there like that. And okay. Must point towards the front. Yep. Back cover. Yep. Oh, then we just put that on. That's got magnets there. Nice. So that's it. I guess we plug it on and it sucks in from the side here and brings it out the top by the looks of it. All right, let's turn it on. All right, uh, problem number one. Uh, not the right plug. It's got that weird Yankee plug on it. If you're going to send something to Australia, not Austria, uh, make sure it has an Aussie plug on it. So that's that's actually got a fixed cord. That gets a thumbs down right there for the fixed cord. I, I want an IEC outlet on that. That's just no. No, no, no. Ha! It's only 120 volts. It doesn't even have the universal voltage on it. Oh, that's a fail. I can plug it into my conversion transformer. Anyway, anyway, it is uh, ETL rated, apparently certi ETL certified. It's got rubber feet on the bottom. I don't know. Feels a bit plasticky. I'm sure it's cheap though. All right, so I plugged it into my uh, transformer here. It's got touchy-feely on here. Oh, look, it lights up all wanky. Um, does that like, <laughs> if the filter fills up, does it like get higher? I don't know. Oh, no, oh, I can smell it. First thing I noticed, so I can smell it. I think I'm on second level. There's turbo mode. So that's turbo mode. Noise-wise, yeah, you wouldn't want to have that running all the time in the lab, but lowest level, that is noise level without getting the sound meter out because it's really hard inside like an office environment here to actually get low uh, sound level. I can say that is louder than my Blue Air uh, 600 on its lowest uh, settings, but the Blue Air has a bigger fan than this one, so granted. I think I could still, if, if I had it in the corner, I could still shoot videos no problem on the first level. So that is, it is quite low, but if it was the only thing you had on, you'd be able to hear it. Yeah, second level is, yeah, you can really start to hear it. 
Let me go to the other side of the room. Yeah, you're definitely, if you were in a room, I'm in a 50 square meter uh, office space here. Yeah, you'd only go on level two if you really needed it. What's this uh, Z mode? Is that a sleep mode? Still turning. So maybe that is a super silent. Yeah, it's got a super silent night mode. It's still spinning and I'm still getting a reasonable, you know, a reasonable amount of air out of that. But it's turned off the lights so they don't disturb you when you sleep. And it's still circulating and there's hardly any noise. Let me put the mic up to it. Even having the microphone, like the air blowing into the mic. You, you can probably hear that. I can see it on the VU meter. That's probably on par with my uh, Dyson, I'd say, at night time. Because we have that in the uh, bedroom at night. The Dyson's on level 2 or something. Actually, it's, it's lower than that. It's probably equivalent to the Dyson on level 1, I'd say. So we do have an info display as well. We can, that's the filter life. It's still 100%. Uh, PPM, there you go. It measures the uh, uh, PPM in the air. So it's 1 microgram per uh, cubic meter. So I can't measure all the fancy stuff and it doesn't have a carbon filter uh, option. That would have been really nice, especially for a uh, lab environment to be able to, you know, pay more to get like a carbon filter for it. But um, it's, it's actually not bad. It's surprisingly okay and it's got a timer mode too. I won't dick around on it. So I believe this is about 250 uh, US bucks and the filters are about 50 US bucks, which makes them uh, cheaper than the Dysons, which are again, Dysons are like half the price of the Blue Air. The Blue Airs are insanely expensive uh, filters. So yeah, the filter cost isn't that bad uh, at all. You know, you might be able to get them, uh, you know, on special sometime or something like that. So stock up on them. They claim you should change the filter every uh, six months or something. But anyway, for a budget air filter, um, it's it seems okay. You know, it's a bit plasticky and I don't like the fact that it's just got a fixed uh, cord on it. Really needed an IEC thing. It's got a bit of wanky uh, lead stuff, but you know, nobody cares about that. But, and I do like how you uh, change the filter in this thing. Oh, yep. It knows, it knows that I have, uh, it turned off the, turned off the fan, but, um, yeah, there you go, the filters are supposed to be, uh, HEPA, would have been nice if it had, like, a temperature, uh, measurement in there as well, but, you know, like, we, we're getting fancy-pantsy now, and it's got an automatic, uh, mode as well, so you can just put it on automatically, it detects, um, it, you know, the particle level and it'll ramp it up, and this is not an ionizing, uh, filter as well, you definitely don't want one of those, you don't want it to be pr producing ozone, uh, because that's pretty terrible for you, um, so yeah, this is just a HEPA filter fan, and, and that's it. Maybe I can do a simple teardown, but there's nothing in it. And that is uh, ETL certified, although I'm not sure what ETL are certifying, the electrical side of it, I guess. I don't think they're certifying the, um, you know, the HEPA. I don't think they do that. So this claims to be a HEPA H13 uh, filter, which is the minimum. You can get H13 or H14. 14's better. Um, but, you know, 13 is just, like, it's, it's fine. It, it is a, like, HEPA rated uh, filter. Apparently this is, like, independently uh, certified by uh, various agencies or something. So, yeah, it, it seemed, well, based on their claims, it seems to, uh, it would do the uh, business. Apparently it is electrostatically charged. So, uh, yeah, they're going to have a high voltage generator on here. So it charges up the particles and then they uh, cling to the uh, filter material in here. They claim tobacco smoke and, uh, you know, stuff like that and pet hair and dust and pollen and, uh, and they claim down to uh, PM 2.5 as well. Um, so yeah, whether or not, uh, my only question here, does that actually generate, does the electrostatic in here actually generate any ozone? My Blue Air one specifically doesn't, um, but I can't find any information about whether or not this generates any uh, residual ozone. It doesn't deliberately do it, but whether, like, if there's any residual ozone at all. I don't know, maybe uh, I have to ask uh, Drio on that one. Well, I'll tell you what, Drio's stock just went up a few points in my book. I emailed them about the uh, ozone thing and they sent me all of the test reports and documents in 10-15 minutes. Hats off! Absolutely incredible. Here it is. Um, yeah, apparently Intertech, um, as well as doing the electrical testing, we'll have a look at that. Um, but they actually certified the ozone, and you can see it's actually uh, this is actually a certified document from Intertech. Um, you know, you can look at the signature panel and all that sort of stuff. You know, in, in different modes in uh, turbo. So here's the emission uh, summary here: 0.001 ppm. Um, I think 
the US EPA is like 50, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 0.05 ppm. I think, I don't know, don't uh, quote me on this. I won't go into all the, all the details. But anyway, um, yeah, here it is. And <laughs> we can get all the like equipment that they used to actually uh, test this thing and everything, the pre-filter, the HEPA filter, um, all that. And carbon are combined as one filter. Does it actually have, I guess it is a carbon impregnated, impregnated filter. It's nothing like my uh, Blue Air, if that's the case. Absolutely nothing like it, or my uh, Dyson either. It doesn't look to be that way. Anyway, so here's the diagrams of all the uh, tests. Here's the uh, peak ozone concentrations in uh, PPM, like 0.007. Um, I do actually have an air, air uh, quality meter, but I think it goes only down to like 0.01 or something like that. It's, you know, and here's the actual test results. So there's the test results in uh, turbo mode there, and now you've got the test results in uh, sleep mode as well. So they've tested the different mo modes, so you can be <laughs> absolutely confident. And here it is. Yeah, here's uh, sleep mode in time over 20. They measured it over 24 hours. And it's less than like 0 0.001 ppm. Absolutely fantastic. Even the major companies like Blue Air and Dyson. Well, maybe you could try and ask them. Um, but, uh, but yeah, um, <laughs> they're, they're happy to hand out this report. So absolutely Fantastic. There's the measurement probe going over the top. And then we've got a uh, certificate here from the California Air uh, R Resources Board. CARB have determined that your device uh, model number complies with the state of California testing electricals and ozone requirements specified in Title 17 California Code of Regulations for Indoor Air Filters. So there you go. Um, independently certified by Intertech and also the California Air Residents board as well and then the EPA have done something here but I just searched that for ozone and I don't know what that's actually uh, doing but something to do with that and then here's the um, Intertech um, authorization uh, mark as well and then the um, FCC uh, test report as well so this was done by Intertech once again certified uh, document by Intertech and we don't have to do the teardown because we already got it anyway this is all the uh, EMC requirements and uh, stuff like that so you know I've, I've shown these uh, test reports before they're very cool um, you can go through them in more detail sometime but this gives you all the plots and everything where it is inside the room this is the anic RF anechoic chamber that they measured it in like here's the the turntable which you know spins it around and they measure you know here's the antenna here like one one to four meters away and test set up and proceed and you know so here's all the um, upper limits to pass uh, the various um, FCC requirements radiate emission above one gig there you go they've got a different uh, type of antenna for measuring above one gig and well all the RF uh, nuts are going crazy um, this is fantastic I love I love test reports like this so here it is inside the uh, anechoic uh, chamber here this is great stuff this is fantastic so yeah they just readily um, sent me this and here we go. Here's some internal uh, Looks like they're not absolutely high-res photos, but there's the uh, there's the main processor board there We will take it out. There we go. It's a bit closer and uh, there will be a separate ionizer board uh, There's the uh, lead panel assembly Internal view. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. So there's your lead panel So they do light up uh, different colors and different maybe different levels as well and that looks like the uh, fan assembly There you go tear down of the Fan motor. <laughs> Terrific stuff. There you go. I don't have to do the teardown. Just, just ask companies, just send me the FCC report. Um, there's our uh, ozone, uh, our, you know, our high voltage uh, generator. There's the back side of the board. And uh, there's the power PCB. There you go. There's the mains power. That looks all right. Don't can't see what brand caps they got there. But, you know, there's the, uh, there's the main PCB. Don't know what processor that is front of the display pcb that was the wi-fi module i'm not going to bother to try that um and that's the uh that's the buttons so the, those uh spring terminals there are for the uh touch for the capacitive uh touch uh extender contacts so there you go i am thoroughly impressed with uh drio like it's it's a reasonable quality unit it's built down to a price i think you can get it even for 220 bucks um and that it's definitely not producing <laughs> like really trace levels of ozone. Absolutely nothing to worry about. And that's uh, certified um, by in ETL and also uh, the California whatever. Beauty. 
So apparently it does change uh, colour based on uh, the quality of the air or whatnot. So yeah, various colours. So it lights up wanky wanky. And it does connect to your shoe phone via your Wi-Fi's and whatnot. And it's Alexa and Googly whatever uh, compatible. So you can, I don't know, talk to it or some rubbish like that. I don't care about that sort of stuff. I just want a decent uh, HEPA filter. You plug in, you turn it on, and Bob's your uncle. Um, So this actually seems... Quite reasonable. I think that's um well worth uh, checking out. It's only uh, 220 bucks, and the filters are only uh, 50 uh, bucks. So uh, there, it seems quite affordable. You know, it's not up to the build quality of uh, your Blue Airs or your Dysons, but still seems reasonable. Not sure if you're seeing that on camera, but it's got. You can see the reflection of uh, my studio light there. It's got a slight wobble. It's got just a very slight wobble. I can there. Yeah, you can actually see it shimmy and wobble. It's it's it does have a slight wobble. I've got that in auto mode, so it's it's in actual low. It's a slight imbalance there. Like it's not a big deal, but I I just noticed it when I saw the lights shimmer like that. <laughs> this thing will apparently do thirteen hundred square feet or roughly you know one hundred and thirty odd uh, square meters, which is more than twice the size of this lab. Eh, yeah, nah. Um, I think that's a bullshit marketing figure. Um, even having it on high, my Blue Air one, uh, which is much bigger than this, is only rated for like a lab of my size, like 50 square meters or something. Um, so yeah, or like 500 square feet, I think. So yeah, this one doing 1300, yeah, nah. Um, <laughs> don't buy it for like a giant space like that. But for, you know, 50 square meter lab like this, it'd do the business. Oh, this one's heavy. I will get another big box out of the way. Um, thank you very much. Oh, Holly Mills, um, who I really hadn't heard of before, before they contacted me and said, hey, you know, um, we, we make micro-inverters because they've seen my uh, Enphase micro-inverter videos. And sure enough, they make micro-inverters and battery storage um, systems and apparently they're a big deal. Um, they're just not here in Australia because um, I've never heard of them. <laughs> Serious hardware. So thank you very much. So needless to say, this is uh, not going to be a teardown that I can probably do on the mail, that's justified on the mail bag. So this might be a twofer video, might do either a second channel or a primary channel video. I don't know, leave it in the comments. You want to see like just a second channel quickie, that's a decent amount of padding material. I'll reuse that. Yeah, so let me know how much of a teardown you want. That's a heavy micro-inverter. That's another heavy micro-inverter. Is it just one? Jeez. Micro-inverter fell out of the, <laughs> of the box. Um, oops. Um, holy goodness. This is a serious bit of kit. Wow. Um, the little end... I don't know how many watts are these because the, the little end phase ones that I've got... They're little in comparison to this beast. Wow, that's a serious bit of kit. I love the feel of that. My spidey sense is really tingling with this one. This looks absolutely great. Yeah, this is designed for a single panel, 60 volts DC input, uh, maximum power point uh, voltage range from 16 to 60 volts. Uh, startup voltage, 22 volts DC. That's good enough for Australia. Uh, maximum continuous input current, uh, four times, oh, it's four, okay. Yeah, well, obviously, yeah, it's it's four channels. This is four micro-inverters in one. So, yeah, no wonder it's so beefy. Um, yeah, 1600 VA. Wow. Actually, this is interesting because I'm thinking... Here we go again. <laughs> Expanding my... I want to put four, maybe five, but four fits, um, four new panels on top of my pergola. And I've done a second channel video showing this. This is a, but that'd give me three different solar power systems. I'd have the Enphase microinverter system. I'd have had this Holly Mills inverter system. I don't know how you'll do the controllery thing for it. I mean, I'm assuming it just works as a microinverter, but if you want to talk to it and control it and get data out of it, then it's going to need another controller box. Maybe that's in here somewhere. Um, and uh, yeah, in theory, this would work great for that. But then I'd have three. I'd have a three. Leave it in the comments. Should I have three? home solar solutions be an absolute masochist um or should i um yeah just consolidate just do a tear down and consolidate uh with the 
at least two that I've existing ones that I've already got. But yeah, that's four in one jobby. Wow. Is that an antenna? Is this like a Wi-Fi thing? I don't know. I have not looked into the details of this uh, yet. Love how it has a convenient carry handle. Yeah, there you go. There's a smaller two-channel jobby. Once again, it's got that little, uh, what I presume is like a wireless antenna thing on the side. So is this like Wi-Fi interface? Anyway, geez, that's a real solid bit of kit. That that big die-cast heatsink is just mwah, beautiful. And then, let me guess, this is a single-channel jobby. Yep. So this says, looks like they make four channel, two channel, or single channel, which is really great. Looks like I've got screws on here. I wonder if they're potted. I will actually do a very quick opening, I think. I need to see if they're potted. Anyway, this single channel one is 400 VA, which is much better, higher than the end phase uh, ones. Mine are, I've done a video on that. Mine are only 295 watts. Uh, 295 VA uh, volts amps um, connected to my 380 watt panels. I've done a video on eh, the pros and cons of doing that. You know, there are there are cons. I'm losing that peak power of my 380 watt panels. So this thing for my 380 watt panels, this is giving me my full 380 watts out. Because during the day, if I want to charge my EV or something, my I've got those new 380 watt uh, panels. They're only connecting my 295 watt N phase microinverters. I think N phase now do like a 340 or 350 or something uh, watt a VA one, but this one's 400 VA, and that looks the same size or smaller than the N phase one. So anyway, leave it in the comments down below if you've used Holly Mills um, micro inverters because <laughs> they look pretty schwick and I've had a look at their website and they look, you know, uh, pretty high end. It's just that I've never heard of them here. So yeah, not a thing in Australia yet, I guess. Yeah, leave it in the comments down below if you've got a Holly Mills one because before they contacted me, I'd never heard of them. Anyway, R3C 18 AWG, wet or dry, of course. So it looks like it's uh, UL listed and everything, as you'd expect. Seems like uh, this is looks like their own uh, custom jobby here. But yeah, I think it's uh, it's going to be uh, the Wi-Fi's and whatnot, standard uh, MC4 connectors. This is uh, really chunky, boy. Let's see if we can open the runt of the litter. <laughs> this is the uh, 400 VA. This tiny little one is still bigger than the biggest um, end phase one you can get. Let's crack her open. So what are the odds of this being potted? What do you think? Leave it in the comments. I know what these are. Are these access holes? That they've, uh, is that where they put the potting, potting compound in? I hope not. Okay, placing bets, placing bets. Well, oh, geez, I can't get that up. Uh, uh, whoa, what's going on here? Yeah, it's, it's stuck down. It's kind of sliding off sideways, so yeah. I think there's some celastic under there holding it down. Oh, this could get ugly. Yeah, I've got to get in there and actually slice the celastic open. Ah, oh, I'm doing it with the screwdriver, but... Oh, no, she's popping, she's popping. There you go. Yep, yep. It's completely popped and potted. Ah, oh, bugger. Yeah, that is a re-enterable, though. This is very cool. This is a... One of these, is, is it a re-enterable potting compound? It's certainly not hard. It looks like it's, um, you can get ones that are what are called a re-enterable potting compound. So you can actually get through and you can adjust pots. You can put actual, you know, you put a screwdriver through, you can adjust, tweak your pot, if you tongue at the right angle, pull it back out and then they, it reheals. And this, it's not quite like some of the re-enterable stuff I've used, but it's similar. Certainly not a hard potting compound, so in theory, I could get all that out. Yeah, I could get all that out if you really wanted me to. So I won't, that's going to be messy. I won't do it uh, on this mailbag video, but leave it down below if you want me to try and get all of that gunk out and we'll be able to reverse engineer this thing. Uh, it's probably thermally conductive too. Insulated, of course, but ugh, ugh, sticky. Look, ugh, look at that. <laughs> Terrific stuff. Anyway, Holly Mills look like a really high-end manufacturer of inverters, um, like micro inverters. Who knew? And uh, yeah, this one's 400 VA. So, as I said, way better than the best um, end phase, the highest end end phase 
uh, one they've got, and this is the runt of the litter. Um, they make like four channel versions of this. So, yeah, unbelievable. Leave in the comments down below if you want me to try and get in this. And I won't do a full reverse engineering, but I'd try and maybe they can uh, provide me with like a block diagram or something. And we can have a, a good look at the PCB. It's down in there somewhere. Um, oh, yeah, there we go. There it is. There it is. Yeah, look, it's, it's going to actually peel off okay. I'm sure everyone's going to say do it. Everyone's going to say do it, aren't they? Yeah, I know everyone's going to say it. I know. But I want engagement on this video. So leave it down below. Give this a thumbs up if you want me to do a separate teardown video of this bad boy. Yes, it looks like they did actually do something through here and through here where they had those... Uh, it looks like they stick on those uh, little covers afterwards. So, yeah, QC pass. So they, um, you know, maybe they fill it up. You can do that with the lid on. Why have I been saying holly mills? It's hoy, hoy miles, hoy mills, hoy mills, Power Electronics Inc. Um, I, for some reason, my mind thought that there was an L in there. Hoy millies, maybe? I, I, somebody knows how to pronounce that. I... <laughs> Please tell me, you know I'm hopeless at it. And I've had this one for a while because I actually wanted uh, to use it. <laughs> I knew they were sending it and when it came in, they wanted to use it but I didn't have enough stuff on the mailbag. So sorry, um, uh, Noyafa. Um, so but, but thank you for uh, sending in. It's, yeah, a, a cable tracer, Ethernet cable tracer. And I have actually used it um, to trace an Ethernet cable um, uh, back to the room. So I'll add some footage of that that I shot, Jesus, like a month ago now, um, of me actually uh, tracing the cable back um, from my lab here down to the comms cupboard uh, down there because I wanted to see where the cable went. I never knew and I found it. So yeah, it does work. It's very cool. So I'm going to uh, do a, I might give you a quick demo and then I'll do a teardown. So here's this uh, Noyafa. We'll turn it on. I have actually uh, used this. I did actually use it to trace an ethernet uh, cable which actually uh, went down to my, the comms cupboard down there. I went down uh, multiple flights down to the uh, comms room but I could not trace it down there I don't know if, if it was this or if it was just me or the cable doesn't go there I don't know but I was actually able to trace it down to the corridor down there so anyway so the receiver that's uh, got in rechargeable battery and uh, it's got uh, different uh, scan modes as well uh, non-contact uh, voltage detector haven't actually tried that anyway it's got two different uh, scan frequencies red and blue like this and you can set that over here so we can do mapping of RJ45, RJ11 and BNC. So uh, power over Ethernet, ping and RJ45 scan, RJ45 main and RJ11 as well and old school BNC if you're still into that uh, sort of stuff. So I've plugged it in here, it's going over to my uh, hub, let's see if it can uh, do it with it's actually plugged into the active hub. So we'll go length, we'll go cat5e and Boom, we can test the length, and yeah, 25.6. Sounds, I don't know, a bit long, but I don't know how long it is in the roof here going back to the uh, cupboard. And it also comes with this uh, wire map adapter, RJ11, RJ45. So if we plug our wire map into here, and we actually uh, select our map in here, we can actually do RJ45 and start, and we're going to see if, yep, the wires map one-to-one -one like that, so you can see if they're uh, crossed or anything. I don't know if I have an Ethernet crossover cable to actually see it. Um, that'd be neat. Uh, anyway, if we do disconnect that and then we restart it, cable open or too short. And it does power over the Ethernet testing, so you can check that. Unfortunately, I don't have a uh, power over the Ethernet hub, so I can't check that out. But anyway, it's um, it, it does quite a few things, and you can get it to uh, ping. You can configure uh, destinations, so let's... Let's see if we can ping our router, can we? I don't know, how do you ping your router? Error chip with that address. I have no idea what that means um, <laughs> at all. Anyway, you get a pair of uh, croc cables like this. So if you got, uh, if you don't have a uh, terminated cable, so I've actually uh, used this uh, myself to do the RJ45 uh, and it works just fine. I was able to like do a single pair on an unterminated uh, cable and I was able to actually uh, trace that. So I put it into um, trace mode. So if we go into scan mode over here, we've got low and high frequency and power. Oh, 
high frequency. Whoop, there we go. And here we go. We can just see once we get close. There we go. It beeps and we can just dial dial the sensitivity right down so we get very close like that. But it's uh, got high and low frequency uh, modes depending on uh, the length and uh, type of cable you got. Two minute teardown. Here you go. Altera Max 2 here with some memory on there. So that's on a daughter board. Can we get that off? Yep, you betcha. And I won't go through the fine details, but that's uh, probably what, I don't know, analog switching, stuff like that. Uh, we do have a compact flash uh, over here and micro uh, USB on the side for uh, charging up. And what's the main processor down here? We've got a real uh, fair nickum relay here. That's a Giga Device GD32F303. Uh, so there you go. It's one of those arm jobbies, is it? That's all she wrote. So there you go. That looks like a nice design. That actually looks neat and tidy, doesn't it? I got no issues with that whatsoever. That is quite a decent build quality. And there's the battery just stuck in the bottom like that. But no wackers. Is that uh, board optional extra on another model or something like that, perhaps? I don't know. But uh, yeah, that's decent. Oh, and this has a tiny little built-in light too. It's not much, but you know, gets the job done. Sort of like points out an angle like this, so it doesn't point directly onto the probe, which, eh, you know. There's a teardown inside the receiver, as you'd expect, not much. Fairly decent size uh, lithium, presumably lithium polymer battery in there. And there you go, there's not much else. There's uh, power supply and uh, miscellaneous uh, stuff. And then the front end, and the probe is just, uh, there you go. Looks like an inductor there, two inductors. They'd be for the different uh, frequency ranges like that and this would be for your uh, non-contact voltage tester I would presume and then you got your two LEDs and Bob's your own there's a watch crystal don't know why there's a watch crystal up uh, that end but uh, and Bob's your own oh there's a bit on the bottom too for completeness there you go it actually has quite a lot um there's our speaker just uh hand wired over there geez you know they're going to do a decent effort there for the uh speaker but there you go we've got a giga devices uh, again, and a couple of miscellaneous whatnots. I haven't looked at that. Can't see those on the camcorder screen. RS2251. All right, there you go. If you really must see what's what under here, there you go. I won't uh, bother looking up those part numbers, but for those playing along at home, you can do that. Knock yourself out. And bonus. So I thought I want to install internet down in my dungeon. So I thought I've actually got an ethernet cable in the roof here. Um, <laughs> it's not terminated, unfortunately, but it goes, I don't know if you can see that. Anyway, it, it, it goes up in the roof and it goes all the way down the corridor. And I've always wondered where it got, uh, where it goes. I assume it goes to the MDF, uh, well, not the MDF, but the uh, junction room down the end of the corridor here, and then down the shaft, right to the MDF room down in the basement. But I've never actually, traced it but now I've got a tool to actually trace this so I'm going to inject I'm going to measure the length first and then I'm going to inject um, a signal into it and go tracing so I'm going to assume that I, I don't actually have a cable um, term believe it or not I cannot terminate ethernet cables here I don't have spare things I don't have the uh, tool to do it so I'm going to assume I'm going to use the RJ11 cable thing that it comes with and I'm going to assume that that's going to work so I'm going to just put that up to a pair, and we should be able to actually measure the length of one pair. Let's actually try it. Uh, I've got Cat5, this is Cat5e uh, cable. So I do believe it should be like a 70 meter, 80 meter, maybe 80 meter total length um, down to my dungeon um, via the MDF uh, room. But anyway, let's, yep, there we go. 20, basically 30 meters. 30 meters, there you go, for the center pair. So just to prove that that actually works, I'm going to disconnect that. Oh, I'll disconnect one side. And can we run that again? Try it again. Cable open or too short. Yeah. Okay. So we've got 30 meters of cable. That is way more than just down to the corridor. It's only like 10, 12 meters, maybe 15 tops down to the corridor. I could pace it out, but it's not far. Maybe 15 meters. So I reckon this cable is going down... Um, I did estimate once, and it was about, I think, 30 metres down to the MDF room or something like that. So, yeah, um, I think this is actually going down um, into the 
in, into the MDF room, which is fantastic. So I don't have to, like, um, you know, pay some uh, cable jockey to come in and uh, pull some Ethernet cable down to the MDF room. So anyway, I'm going to uh, use the cable uh, tracing feature of this, the scanning feature. Here it is. And, okay, we've got low frequency and high frequency. I'll just try the low frequency first. Yep, so you can see how it fo it'll follow the twist. Yep, it'll follow like the twist in there or whatever. Anyway, so I can have a high frequency or low frequency. I might try the high frequency, see if that makes a difference. Yep, so I can, yeah, I can definitely find that. So I'm going to go down the corridor and have a squiz. So here's the, uh, I guess, like junction cupboard, I don't know what you call it, at the end of the uh, corridor here. But uh, there you go, it's got all sorts of uh, stuff in here. It's got the patch panel there, and that's where a lot of the ethernet, you can see the blue ethernet uh, trunk in, come in from the, uh, down in the floor there. That goes right through the uh, cable guts of this thing. It, uh, anyway, so I'm gonna go in there and have a squiz. Yeah, got it. Yeah, found it. It's all bundled in there. Pretty sure that one's mine. Pretty sure I found it. Winner, winner. Chicken dinner. Not, not that it matters. All I really care is that it actually goes down to the uh, basement. So, ooh, spooky. So I actually think this thing's uh, pretty groovy. It's relatively uh, low cost. And if you're after one of these, uh, you know, comprehensive cable testers, they've got various uh, models that do uh, various things, either simpler or maybe even slightly more uh, complex. But, you know, even for my use, um, just for testing like ethernet cables, find tracing them like this, finding out where they go and stuff, um, it, it does the job very, oh, it died. Oh, there we go, a screensaver. Um, it seems to work reasonably nicely so worth checking out i'll link it in down below thank you very much noyafa